Good evening and welcome to today's BIC streams for our program on the US election titled, How Did the Party of Lincoln Become the Party of Trump? This program is in collaboration with the Bangalore Literature Festival as part of their World Lit series. The election is the topic of the week, being followed closely by people all over the world as we head towards election day on November 3rd. Uh, we are pleased to have with us Professor Julian Zelizer, who comes to us from New York to give us some historical context and a perspective on the election. Welcome to our program, Professor Zelizer. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh, for a brief introduction, Professor Julian Zelizer is Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University and a CNN political analyst. He's the author and editor of 21 books and over a thousand op-eds. He's been among the pioneers in the revival of American political history. His book on Lyndon Johnson won the D.B. Hardiman Prize for the best book on Congress. And with Kevin Cruz, he's written an expansive history of the United States since 1974 in his book, Fault Lines. His new book is Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, the fall of a speaker, and the rise of the new Republican Party. He also co-hosts a popular podcast called Politics and Polls. Professor Zelizer will take questions from the audience at the end of his talk. You can type your questions in the Q&A box as we go along. So to begin with, could you give us some context for the two-party system that emerged in the 19th century? The framers of the Constitution had warned against it. John Adams, uh, George Washington's successor, said in the late 18th century that a division of the Republic into two great parties is to be dreaded as the great political evil. But as you point out in your recent book, by the mid 19th century, bloody altercations on the floors of the House and the Senate were regular occurrences in the decades leading up, leading up to the Civil War uh, in the argument over slavery. So in the recent debate, President Trump again invoked the name of Abraham Lincoln. What did the Republican Party stand for at the time of Abraham Lincoln? Yeah, so thank you again, and it's wonderful to be with you. And the founders, are you're correct, they, they feared very much the impact of partisan division in the United States, and they feared what would happen if the country had its politics organized around party, but very quickly that fell apart. And historians who study uh, the early part of the country's history through the Civil War trace how the parties take hold very quickly. Uh, you have the evolution of several political parties during the 19th century, uh, culminating uh, with the establishment of the Republican Party, which becomes the major force in the Civil War, which takes place from uh, 1861 to 1865 here in the United States. And Abraham Lincoln uh, was the Republican president when our nation split apart in the Civil War. And he becomes a symbol for this founding period of the party because the party emerges in the 1850s. It's triumphant as the party in power during the Civil War. And after the Civil War, it very much tries to define the parameters of what does an America without slavery look like? And Lincoln becomes a symbol of two things. One is ending the system of slavery that had very much defined the United States economy. Uh, and two, being the party of union, meaning his primary mission was to, present, to prevent the dissolution of the country uh, during the Civil War. And he very much fought and articulated and became himself a symbol of the nation coming back together, uh, even with bitter divisions. And so both of those uh, were very important. And I'd add, he was just a successful president. And, and that always matters. Uh, parties in America have certain presidents who did very well. They, they achieved generally what they set out to do. And I think you can argue that uh, with Abraham Lincoln before his tragic assassination. Uh, and, and because of that, I think there's a kind of a founding myth and he became very important in that way uh, 
uh, in terms of establishing the importance of the Republican Party. Um, so these North, South and regional divides persist in politics today, don't they? As does the legacy of slavery, of course. Um, emancipation happened, slavery ended. Uh, there was some progress made with reconstruction, but then you have a backlash, Jim Crow laws and segregation with violence and discrimination that really lasted a century. Uh, so to fast forward, it took a hundred years for African-Americans to get access to voting rights with an act that Lyndon Johnson signed into effect in 1965. And there was also, of course, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, looking through the bookshelf of your work, Professor Zeliza, among the many presidents you have written about, Johnson seems to be the earliest. He'd been vice president, became president when John F. Kennedy was assassinated in 63, and then faced an election in 64 in which he won a landslide. Could you tell us a bit about that election? What was the relevance of Barry Goldwater's campaign against Johnson in 64, maybe? Yeah, so so let me, I'm going to, um... I'm going to get to that and let me just back up with something that might be important to viewers in terms of what happens to the Republican Party. I, th I think you outlined very um, cogently what happens in the United States. The Civil War ends. We go through a period called Reconstruction here where the Republican uh, Congress tries to reconstitute the nation and, and create a system uh, that would try to achieve more equality for African Americans, that falls apart. And by the early 20th century, what you have in the South, which is heavily democratic, it's almost entirely democratic, uh, you have the reconstitution of a system of racial segregation and inequality. There is no slavery, um, but, but many other problems emerge, including uh, the inability of African Americans to vote and uh, legal segregation, uh, where living facilities were separated and, and great economic hardship. And the Republican Party, right through the time of Lyndon Johnson's presidency, it changes, it evolves. And by the 1940s, 1950s, and early 1960s, uh, the Republican Party is uh, kind of characterized by several things. One is it's a party that's deeply divided. It's divided the Republican Party between one wing of Midwestern Republicans who are very conservative. They don't believe in much government. They are very opposed to unions. They fight for low rates of taxation. Uh, and they're just hesitant to call on Washington to do almost anything. And in addition to the Midwestern Republicans, you had liberal Republicans in Northeastern states of the United States, like New York, who were Republican, they were conservative, they believed in uh, strong defense against communism, they were not for all sorts of government, but they were pretty progressive on issues like racial equality, on issues like poverty policy, they often would ally with Democrats to push for these, these sorts of programs. So, so the party was very much split. And even though we talk about Abraham Lincoln before Johnson wins re-election in 1964, there had been two major Republican presidents who Republicans thought about all the time. One was Herbert Hoover, who had been the president of the United States from 1929 to 1933 as the Great Depression takes hold in the United States, and he becomes a symbol of failure. He became a symbol of what Republicans failed to do in the modern era, when he failed to call for enough government to save the country, when he failed to respond to the severity of the economic crisis. And the second major president was Dwight Eisenhower, who was a military hero, and he was president in the United States, a Republican from 1953 to 61, enormously popular, one of our most popular presidents. And Eisenhower, who was conservative, accepted, though, the role of government in the United States. He accepted what Franklin Roosevelt, our president in the 1930s and 40s, had put into place. And he basically said Republicans have to learn to live within the system in which they governed. Uh, and he was probably the most well-known, I'd say, Republican in a positive way since Abraham Lincoln. So you had this deeply divided party uh, before the 1960s. You had a party that kind of had pressure pushing it to the center. 
And on Capitol Hill, Republicans usually were out of power. Um, the Democrats controlled Congress for much of the period from 1932 through 1964, with two very short exceptions. Uh, so it was a party that forever was struggling to gain power. And the 1964 elections where I start kind of my path usually to the modern GOP, in that Lyndon Johnson, uh, who was a Southern Democrat who became president in November of 1963 when uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, Johnson, although he was from that South, although he came from an area that was much more conservative, uh, he turned out to be very liberal. And uh, in his first year as president, he pushed for a major civil rights bill, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ended legal segregation in the United States. He pushed for a poverty program. And he had to run for re-election in 1964. And he ran for re-election against someone named Barry Goldwater, who was a very conservative Republican from Arizona, who believed that the Republican Party was too much in the center, that they had to stand for conservative principle, and they had to be open about this. Uh, Goldwater voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He criticized Social Security, the nation's program that provides elderly Americans with pensions. Uh, and he runs against Lyndon Johnson. His supporters are able to get him the nomination, which is a dramatic thing in 1964. Um, many thought that the next major figure of the GOP would be someone named Nelson Rockefeller, who was the governor of New York, who was part of that liberal wing. But Goldwater wins the nomination. He runs against Johnson. And Johnson really mounts a pretty brutal campaign against Goldwater saying this guy isn't fit to serve. He's so conservative, he's gonna destroy everything uh, in, in the country. He's gonna take away your social security. He's against civil rights. He doesn't care about the poor. And, and Goldwater doesn't back down. He sticks to his principle, but he loses. Uh, he loses in one of the biggest landslides in American history. And, and, and Johnson comes out of that election with a mandate and a Democratic Congress, and he passes all kinds of legislation. So initially, Goldwater becomes a symbol for Republicans of, well, we can't be too conservative philosophically because this country won't accept that. But over time, Goldwater's philosophical arguments actually become the template of the modern Republican Party, this very right-wing vision of the uh, primacy of markets over government and a kind of resistance to using government to ameliorate social problems will slowly become the agenda of, of the Republican Party. And the first Republican who starts to mount a comeback is Richard Nixon, who wins the presidency in 1969 against Lyndon Johnson's vice president, Hubert Humphrey, and will serve one and a half terms. He will resign in disgrace in 1974 as a result of a scandal called Watergate. But he starts to try to kind of bring back the party. He, he stays separate from Goldwater, but he's still significant in that he reestablishes Republicans can be president. Uh, and he starts to orchestrate what's called the Southern strategy. He's more subtle than Goldwater. He doesn't explicitly accept right-wing conservatism, but he starts to appeal to Southern Democrats and say, come join the Republican Party. And he plays on what's called backlash politics in the United States. He plays to the opposition to civil rights. He plays to an anger about what the civil rights movement had done uh, in this country. And this becomes part of the basis of his coalition. But he too, in the end, won't remake the party because his uh, presidency ends in this in this huge scandal. So in the early, that period, the 1960s to the early 70s, I think what's really significant are both the kind of arguments that Goldwater put out, even though in the end he's a loser uh, politically, but his arguments I think really resonate. And then Nixon with the Southern strategy, even though he too is seen as one of the great failures because of Watergate, I think that strategy, both of those become part of the template of modern Republican parties, politics. Um, I, I should also mention that part of uh, uh, Johnson's legacy is the uh, 
Immigration Act of 1965, which opened the way for certain kinds of immigrants from India. So it's sort of significant for us uh, in terms of Johnson. Um, Ronald Reagan is credited with the right turn in American politics. Up to that point, even, even Richard Nixon um, had established the Environmental Protection Agency, wanted universal health care. Uh, Reagan's ideological view of government was quite different. How did Reagan's victory in the 1980 election change the Republican Party? So R Ronald Reagan's a really interesting, fascinating figure. And, and he actually was part of that 1964 campaign that we discussed. One of the few successes of Goldwater's campaign was an ad that runs toward the very end of the campaign that features Ronald Reagan, uh, who had become well known in conservative circles. He had been a Hollywood actor, but he uh, then started traveling around the country giving speeches about conservatism. He does this ad it's called A Time for Choosing, where he gives this very powerful speech outlining what Goldwater's vision is. Um, and, and that's one of the high points. And, and then he'll be governor of California uh, serving for two terms and he'll gain prominence. Uh, and then in 1976, Ronald Reagan challenges uh, Republican President Gerald Ford during the primaries here in the United States and almost wins. Uh, and his whole primary challenge is a little like Goldwater. He argues that the Republican Party has to embrace its conservative values. And he loses though. And, and then he spends the late seventies doing this radio show, which is very popular in the United States, a weekly radio show. And he spoke about all sorts of issues from cutting taxes to fighting communists, to getting rid of the internal revenue service, which is our government agency that collects taxes. Uh, and Reagan runs in 1980 for the presidency against Jimmy Carter, who's the president, a Democrat who's struggling in 1980. Uh, with the Iran hostage crisis and uh, a failing economy and Reagan wins. And it's a significant, significant moment because Reagan, like Goldwater, runs as an unabashed conservative. And he really promotes conservative principles and he links himself to this grassroots conservative movement that had taken hold in the 1970s in American politics that included evangelical Christians and hawkish Republicans who wanted to really ramp up the nation's defense after the failures of Vietnam, and he wins. And his victory is a signal for many in this country that conservatives now hold power, that the Republican Party has shifted to the right. And unlike 1964, that's a winning formula. And Reagan will spend much of the 1980s fighting to keep articulating and pushing this very conservative philosophy, which was captured in his inauguration when he said that uh, government is not the solution, government is the problem. And he really tries to shift the conversation more in the direction of uh, promoting free markets, deregulating uh, the government, and even weakly using government programs that were already in existence. And he serves two terms. Um, he's very controversial as a president, but by the end of his presidency, I think one of his major successes is he's shifted the Republican Party to the right. The debate no longer feels the need within the party to talk about moderation, to talk about uh, liberalism is still something that's good. It's, it's kind of shifted in dramatic ways. So that's part of that 1980s, and that's why Reagan is such a pivotal figure. And the second thing that happens in the 80s, which um, was the theme of my book, is you see a very new kind of strategy emerge within the Republican Party that is a complement to this very rightward philosophy. And the person who promotes it most heavily is someone named Newt Gingrich, uh, who's a congressman from Georgia in the 1980s, who is rising up through his party uh, and causing a lot of trouble. And uh, Gingrich argues that Republicans basically have to be far more ruthless in their partisanship if they're ever going to achieve power in Congress. And he argues that uh, there needs to be a kind of partisanship without guardrails, meaning unlimited uh, kind of uh, tactics that the party is willing to embrace. Partisanship had to be more important than governing, 
partisanship had to be more important than worrying about the health of our political institutions, Republicans had to focus on obtaining power. And Gingrich becomes a major figure in the 80s and then becomes Speaker of the House in 1994, promoting this new style of uh, partisan warfare, which more and more Republicans start to adopt. And I think those are two twin factors, one pushed by Reagan through the presidency, the second pushed by Gingrich and his allies in Congress that start to come together by the 1990s. Yeah, you, your recent book on Newt Gingrich reads like a cautionary tale, really. Um, this foot soldier in the Reagan revolution, as you call him, uh, Michelangelo to Trump's David, an outlier, self-described pirate, um, and uh, really makes the brand so much more hard hitting and confrontational in its, uh, its kind of partisan warfare, where nothing is sacred and you just take on the establishment and uh, with no regard for institutions or decorum or civility, really. I lived in Washington in the, at the time of the lockdowns, um, or, or sorry, the shutdowns, lockdowns are today, uh, and they seemed so shocking at the time. Uh, but, you know, if you're starting from a place of saying government is the problem, that's a real change from what had gone before. I think that's right. And the two went hand in hand and that um, because the party embraced this philosophy that government uh, was a problem and government wasn't really necessary, it opened the door for Gingrich's argument that there, there didn't need to be restraints in what you did in partisan politics, because uh, if government became dysfunctional as a result of that, if, if government couldn't work because the parties uh, were in such a toxic atmosphere, that was okay for Republicans. It wasn't for Democrats who still believed in government, but Republicans could live with that. And the shutdown of the government in, uh, 1995 and 96, which I was in Washington as well. I remember that I was a graduate student finishing my doctoral work. Uh, that was shocking at the time and it reflected very much. That was the first real thing that happens in Gingrich's speakership, uh, showed how far the Republicans were willing to go. You also saw it in the language that Republicans were willing to use. Uh, Gingrich famously would promote uh, uh, kind of a lexicon for other Republicans to use about Democrats that at the time was seen as totally out of bounds. Now it doesn't seem that way. Um, but there's literally a memo he circulates in 1990 where he tells Republican candidates that to win, they have to speak like Newt and they have to call Democrats sick and traitorous and be willing to really say the most vicious things to criminalize their opponents. And that was okay. Uh, and that was another way, in addition to procedure, that uh, Gingrich really pushed the boundaries. And, and one other thing I'll just add, another kindred spirit to Gingrich, and he was on that opening slide you had. Uh, well, he wasn't on it, but he was behind it. It was a guy named Lee Atwater, who was a campaign consultant uh, for Republicans. He ran campaigns. And as Gingrich is starting to make waves in Washington and really introduce this new form of politics at the highest level of the Republican party, in 1988, Lee Atwater runs the presidential election campaign of George H.W. Bush, the vice president who's succeeding Reagan, uh, who runs against someone named Michael Dukakis, who was a governor from Massachusetts, who was a very centrist, technocratic Democrat who believed in moderation and he wasn't ideological. But Atwater, like Gingrich was doing in Congress, puts together a really vicious campaign that uh, characterizes Dukakis as a left wing, uh, unpatriotic uh, person who basically wants criminals to run amok in the United States and have people burning American flags and he plays on racial backlash politics. There's a famous ad about a furlough program in Massachusetts where one, that, that Dukakis didn't start actually, but it took place while he was governor. And, and one weekend, one of the prisoners furloughed was a guy named Willie Horton, an African-American man. He escaped, he raped a woman, attacked her boyfriend and conservatives ran with that. George Bush talked about this all the time, which was playing on racial backlash. And, and so you could see in the party all these different elements really coming together before we reach the 21st century. 
but a headline grabbing provocateur like Newt um, knew the power of the media, clearly. So conflict equals exposure equals power, he liked to say. And uh, giving the media packaged confrontations, as you say, was what was needed. So uh, we talk about social media today changing the political landscape with Trump's tweets uh, that have held people's attention, whether you're for or against. But uh, much earlier, how did talk radio and Fox News shape the climate of conservatism? You know, this, uh, you know, maybe around the time of the uh, Dukakis campaign um, from, from that time period or earlier? The great question. So uh, as we're going through this history of the party, uh, a compliment or what's happening in addition to the changes within the Republican Party, this rightward philosophical turn, this aggressive form of partisanship taking hold, uh, the, the media is changing. And the media is extremely important to this new Republican Party. And, and I think of it in two ways. Um, one thing that Republicans were doing very well in the 1980s is just capitalizing on what today might be called the mainstream media, just the major television networks and newspaper and, and most important cable television, which is emerging on the scene in the United States. Uh, and there's news stations. Uh, CNN goes on the air in 1980 uh, and uh, other news stations will start to follow. Uh, and one thing conservatives understand is this is an important way in which Americans absorb their politics. And, and the Republicans by the 80s are trying to uh, perfect their techniques in selling their message through this medium. For Reagan, that meant in the 1980s really choreographing everything that happened in his presidency so that it was almost made for television. He literally, uh, Reagan, had a line for the day, every day uh, of his presidency where the morning would start with him and a group of advisors, including um, David Gergen and Michael Beaver, deciding what should the theme be. And everything that happened during the day revolved around that theme, the photo ops, the appearances on television, so that Americans were kind of seeing a, a consistent message for the day. And Gingrich, on the other hand, uh, kind of followed the quote you just said, and he understood that in the new media that was emerging by the 80s, especially with cable, conflict mattered, that the, the press was drawn to conflict and, and uh, drawn to provocative material. So part of what Republicans were doing already by the 80s is providing just that, saying just blistering things about their opponents and throwing out all kinds of smear and accusations and doing dramatic theatrics on the floor of Congress just to get attention. And it worked, it worked very much. That then changes in that in addition to working the regular media and, and paying attention to this more than Democrats had been, uh, you start to see conservative media take hold, explicitly um, uh, partisan uh, journalism. And uh, one thing that happens that your viewers might not be as familiar with is in 1987, the Reagan administration uh, allows something to end called the Fairness Doctrine. This was a, a regulation that had been in place since 1949, which required radio and television stations to essentially broadcast both sides of any political debate. You put one side on, you had to put the other. And it didn't always work. People didn't always follow the rules, but it had created pressure on radio stations and television stations to think about that and often to avoid any kind of news that was explicitly partisan. But Reagan lets this die in 1987. And then between 1987 and 1992, you see a massive proliferation of conservative talk radio. These were shows on air throughout the country that were very, very right wing in their content, that were openly political in terms of what their hosts wanted to say and become very important to Republican politics. Uh, they were often places where politicians, local members of Congress would appear. They become very important in Republican constituencies in spreading the word about certain kinds of issues. And they become a phenomenon in this country. And there are some national stars. Uh, one is Rush Limbaugh, uh, who it's this period. He has a national show. And he becomes one of the most important figures for the party. And by 1994, when Gingrich becomes Speaker of the House, uh, 
the Republicans in Washington are even coordinating directly with some of these radio shows. They're sending them, this is what we're gonna focus on today. And the radio shows would, would talk about it. And then after that comes conservative television. Um, most notably in 1996, uh, uh, a, a kind of media tycoon named uh, Rupert Murdoch starts a station here in the United States called Fox News. And he puts the, uh, a political consultant, a Republican consultant named Roger Ailes, who had worked for Richard Nixon back in the 1960s on his campaigns, who had worked with Reagan and Bush on their campaigns, who helped elect lots of members of Congress like Mitch McConnell, who's currently our Senate majority leader here in the United States. And they create this channel, which initially is just, it's a conservative channel, but it's not openly, it's not so political. But by 1998, uh, Fox News is one of the most kind of powerful voices of the conservative political world. And that station is producing openly political material taking on President Bill Clinton during the impeachment uh, proceedings that happened against him. And so by the end of the 1990s, uh, combined with this new Republican party that's taking form, you have a very elaborate world of conservative media that ranges from radio to television, also to print and increasingly online um, sources that is very important to the information flow between Republicans, politicians, and Republican voters. And in that conservative media, the news is often extremely provocative. It's a little like what Gingrich had promoted in Congress. It looks for sensationalism. And like Gingrich, it sees almost no restraint in terms of what you're able to say about uh, the Democrats, about liberals in America. And that only intensifies uh, as the station uh, kind of develops its chops. Um, so Newt's role as speaker in the Clinton years is followed by George W. Bush coming into office in the 2000 election against Al Gore, for which of course the results were contested, shall we say. Um, what were some of Bush's successes and failures within the party? Why did he fail to create a new Republican coalition. Yeah, Bush is a fascinating figure. Um, and as often happens, initially wasn't taken seriously. He was seen as a lightweight, someone who wasn't very intelligent. Um, but in the end, I think he had a pretty uh, important impact. And uh, the 2000 election itself, which is in the news today all the time, uh, was a symbol of just how, how polarized the country was becoming. And uh, the way in which Republicans handled that uh, is often seen as a symbol of how far their partisanship had gone. They were willing to really politicize the recount, use the courts aggressively to stop a recount, and ultimately that's part of their path uh, to power. Um, but in some ways, uh, kind of Bush is a culmination of this new Republican Party. He's a two-term president. He orchestrates a uh, revolution really, or a, not a revolution, but a transformation in our counterterrorism programs after 9-11, um, vastly expanding our uh, counterterrorism infrastructure, changing the organization of government in ways that we're still living with. Obama wouldn't um, remove those at all. So he also is pretty transformative in terms of tax cuts. He pushes through a very large tax cut, regressive tax cut in the United States, uh, both in 2001 and 2003, which is kind of a culmination of what Reagan had started when he was cutting taxes. And I think that was another consequential policy. And uh, finally, another policy uh, area um, where he's very influential is deregulation. He, really is an opponent of regulations trying to curb climate change. And he uses executive power to diminish a lot of the programs that Clinton had put on the books um, to uh, curb carbon uh, emissions. So uh, his most controversial policy is obviously uh, the war in Iraq, um, which goes terribly, which many Americans don't support. They don't understand the connection with 9-11. But what he isn't able to do, so, so he has all these policies that I think we'll be debating for years, 
terms of their relevance and people disagree on their you know, uh, success or failure. But what he doesn't do is change the direction of the Republican Party very much. Um, meaning he embraces the rightward turn um, that Reagan had started. And, and he's a very conservative president, even though he talks about uh, compassionate conservatism and supports certain areas of government intervention, such as in education. Uh, or at the very end of his presidency, he accepts government intervention to save the economy when the United States is in an economic freefall, when the markets collapse. He's still pretty philosophically conservative and, and doesn't really accept a role uh, for much government. So he doesn't change the party that way. Uh, he's still working in those parameters. And second, he doesn't change this hard right uh, kind of partisanship that's emerging in Congress. Uh, so he's a president where Republicans control Congress for much of the time. And he finds that it's a pretty far rightward party. And he discovers this, I'd say most uh, importantly, in 2005 and 2006, Bush has been reelected, uh, which in the United States gives him something of a mandate. And he tries to put together an immigration reform package. Uh, which would create a path to citizenship for 11 million undocumented persons here in the country. Uh, at the same time, he would also push for tighter border control and restrictions. It was seen as a grand bargain. And Bush very much believed in a more liberal immigration policy for this country. He grew up in Texas. He grew up in communities and cultures surrounded with immigrants. And, and he really genuinely believed that uh, for the country, it was better to embrace the direction that we had been in since 1965, since that bill you mentioned. And for the party, he believed the Republicans could create a grand coalition by appealing to Latino voters uh, and, and kind of using immigration as a way to broaden the GOP rather than allow the party to become narrow. But it's a total failure. And what he discovers is Republicans in his own party have no interest in this. They are moving far to the right on immigration. And uh, this was an example of where he can't really remake the party. And even at the end of his presidency in 2008, when he pushes for a stimulus to save the economy as it's getting out of control at the end of his presidency, he basically has to do it over the opposition of Republicans. He allies with Democrats because he sees the party is not moving there. So he's interesting and I do think he's significant. I think his policies, uh, we're still wrestling with them in this country, both the failures of Iraq, but also uh, the transformations he put into place. But in terms of the GOP, uh, he doesn't change the direction. And in some ways he accelerates this rightward drift because a lot of Republicans are mad at him. They see him as a failure. They see him as someone who, even though he was very conservative, accepted too much government. And by 2009, what you're seeing in Republicans is a younger generation who came of age in the Reagan and Gingrich era, and they see Bush as a one-off. And they see him as someone who was too much a centrist. And they call for a much more rightward push to go even further than the Gingriches and Reagans had. So in 2008, in the Obama-McCain contest, there was the governor of Alaska who stood for vice president, Sarah Palin. Did she play a role in the evolution of the GOP? She did. And um, I think she's a perfect figure to, to see where the Republicans were landing uh, at the end of the Bush presidency. And it, it wasn't landing. So 2008, just uh, for those who don't remember, when Bush ends his presidency, he's seen as uh, really uh, a kind of disastrous two-term president. His approval ratings are very low. Uh, Iraq has just become one of the most uh, kind of catastrophic policy disasters that the country has faced. And there's all sorts of questions about will the Republican Party survive and what's going to happen to it. But the response of most Republicans isn't to embrace a, a kind of party that will uh, reach out to more people or uh, think of a Republican party that can build a big coalition. 
Instead, it doubles down on this rightward drift. And Sarah Palin is a, a perfect figure at the moment. She was the governor of Alaska. Uh, John McCain, who is a centrist Republican, picks her as her, his vice presidential running mate, and she overwhelms the campaign. And uh, she starts to really elevate uh, voters who a lot of Republicans knew were part of the party, but hadn't totally acknowledged. Um, a lot of her rallies focus on accusations that Barack Obama, their opponent, is uh, uh, Muslim, and people in the audiences of these rallies would yell out, terrorist, terrorist. She attacked the media. She talked about the lamestream media and argued that most of the news media was biased against conservatives and couldn't be trusted. And she introduced really ugly forms of politics into the mainstream. She went even farther than Lee Atwater back in 1988. And even though she was part of the losing ticket, even though uh, she's only the vice presidential candidate, I think she very much captured where the Republican Party was moving. Uh, and, and the decision in 2008, not to change the ways of the party, but in fact, to double down on everything that had happened after they're defeated and Democrats control the White House and Congress. I think she even, um, uh, if I remember right, um, creationism and I mean, she thought that evolution had, had to be taught in schools as one of the possibilities. Um, in, um, it was very much anti-science, which again, yeah. she doesn't invent. Um, the Bush administration, uh, people forget, had been very controversial because it attacked scientific expertise all the time on issues like climate change and stem cell research. Uh, but she goes even further, whether it's creationism uh, or simply just her all-out dismissal of, of the world of experts and their role in American politics. A lot of what you hear with uh, President Trump today, you can just replay uh, video of her rallies and, and interviews and you hear it already. She was talking about all of that. There's a great documentary that was made by uh, Christina Pelosi, who was, is the daughter of Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. And she made a movie in 2008 that um, it's really useful. It focuses on the rallies of Sarah Palin and it, looks at what's going on in the crowds and it exposes this really reactionary side of the Republicans that um, that was pretty, it, it, it's turned out now, I think everyone sees how much it is part of the party, but hadn't really received enough attention. So uh, some see the rise of the Tea Party and the election of Trump as a kind of backlash to having had a black president in Obama. And um, others see it as being born out of communities that felt economically disaffected. Um, what was the appeal and significance of the Tea Party in 2010 and 2011? Yeah, I think I, I, uh, I when I talk about that, so the, the Tea Party again, uh, so the, the Republicans lose, uh, Democrats have control of uh, the White House with Barack Obama and Democrats control the House and Senate in the United States. And the first year of the presidency, uh, there's a lot of big initiatives that get through Congress, including the Affordable Care Act, which is our new health care system, uh, the economic stimulus program, which is a massive stimulus, unlike any we've had since the New Deal here in the United States, and financial regulations. That was a very expansive program to try to curb the kinds of risks that were allowed and tolerated here. Uh, and then in 2010, when we have our midterm elections, which are the congressional elections that come in the middle of a president's term, uh, Republicans do very well. They retake control of the House. And, and the Republicans who are at the forefront are called Tea Party Republicans and embracing this idea of, of using the American Revolution and the Tea Party as symbols of a rebellious bunch. And they run a campaign uh, campaigns across the country that are pretty extreme in what they're calling for, draconian cuts in government, using the kind of toxic language about Obama uh, that had been reserved for talk radio and, and much more. I think it was driven in part, there clearly was backlash going on, meaning backlash to having an African-American president. And that 
that becomes clear over time. Uh, a lot of constituents were uh, holding up really terrible images of, of Obama, racist images and using racist language. I think even when a lot of Tea Party Republicans weren't talking about it, they're trying to capitalize on the backlash, which today is now uh, very, very evident. Uh, they would all participate, not all, but many of them would participate in what was called the birther movement uh, in 2012, where they questioned the birthplace of Barack Obama and raised questions of the legitimacy of the president. I think the Tea Party, though, also uh, was offering their response to the economic inequality that was becoming so severe here in the US and trying to appeal to communities of white Americans who were struggling economically and who felt that they didn't know um, where their next paycheck was going to come from. And, and you know, playing, playing to that in addition uh, to race. But finally, I also think they were just an extension of the Republican Party. This, it wasn't totally new. It was just a younger, more extreme version of what the party had been doing for a while. So in some ways, this was a grassroots mobilization of the conservative activists and voters who were very much part of the landscape since the 1980s and tapping into that in response to this very bold president uh, who was pushing initiatives. So I think there are lots of things going on, but they then become in the, in the 2000s, uh, 2010s, the voice of the GOP. And uh, they bring together everything we've been talking about. Uh, they, they use every procedure uh, ruthlessly uh, to obtain power. People like Mitch McConnell are literally willing to do almost anything. Uh, and, and they are willing to shut down the government. So what you saw in 95 and 96 becomes normal. They're willing uh, at one point to threaten to send this entire country into default uh, by, do, by not raising the debt ceiling. And the rhetoric is a whole new level of rhetoric. It's what Gingrich had been calling for. They talk about Democrats, uh, such as Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, as criminals and uh, are constantly questioning their patriotism. They are raising questions about Obama's birthplace. And, and they're going on Fox television and talk radio. And now they're, they're almost totally in unison in terms of the extremism. Uh, of, of the rhetoric. So I think by the middle of, of the Obama presidency, while some Republicans are still calling for a return to some older order, it's very clear that in the House and Senate, this is the Republican Party. Uh, and, and the Tea Party is the driving force until 2016. So to our present moment between the pandemic and the president, do we have a perfect storm? Um, how is the Republican Party faring under Donald Trump? So it is a perfect storm. And um, it, here, I think the commentary on, on, on President Trump since uh, 2017 has veered between those who say that President Trump is remaking the Republican Party and that he's introduced and uh, succeeded in bringing out this populist conservatism and brought down the establishment, the Bushes, et cetera. And there's another side, which I tend to be more on, as you can tell from this talk, that he's very much the product of many decades of the Republican Party changing. And you can only understand how he gets the nomination, how he wins, and how even through a pandemic, he has maintained pretty much the support of the entire Republican Party to this day uh, in ways that are hard to fathom given uh, kind of the catastrophe that this country has suffered through, you would expect uh, a drop and, uh, of support. And it hasn't happened. And, and so I think uh, the history we've reviewed uh, during our discussion explains uh, kind of why Trump is the Republican uh, president and why he has so much support within the Republican Party. He's clearly an extreme version of what Republicans are today. Uh, because personally, he's uh, unusual to say the least. But I think in terms of his policies, such as a hard line on immigration, a really hard line on deregulation, uh, a total skepticism of science as we're seeing during the pandemic and a war on science, all of that has been brewing in the Republicans since Reagan won office or since Goldwater ran 
unsuccessfully in 1964. In terms of his willingness to break uh, all norms and just ignore the idea that governance and the preservation of institutions should also be a priority to leaders in addition to partisanship, he doesn't believe that. And that comes out very much of this new era of extreme Republican partisanship, which is much more extreme than you see among most Democrats at this point uh, in, in our history. So, so, so he's a culmination. How do they fare? That's a different question. Um, they fare well in that they do control the Senate and they do control the White House. And I would argue that there are certain things you can see in the Trump presidency already that will last for a long time. Um, today, as we're having this discussion, the Senate's about to uh, confirm uh, the, uh, his nominee, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, which will create a 6-3 conservative block on the Supreme Court, which is dramatic. Um, that gives conservatives uh, a, a pretty uh, formidable coalition uh, that will have effect on voting rights, regulation, reproductive rights, immigration, and much more. He's done uh, at the federal courts more broadly. He's moved very effectively to push the courts to the right. On deregulation, I think it will be hard for a Democrat to undo a lot of what he has done in terms of uh, weakening our response to climate change. He's pushed the debate on immigration far to the right. Um, you know, where Bush still was talking about a path to citizenship as part of a deal, he doesn't talk about that anymore. He shifted the discussion to, at best, restoring the Dreamers Act, which uh, Obama had put into place, but really focusing on borders and uh, family separation and much more. So I think he will be consequential, it'll be hard to undo. But the second question is what happens to the GOP? And we don't know. Um, the, the history that we've talked about, one part of this is that Republicans, because they never tried to build a big coalition, have been moving in the direction of a narrow or narrower constituency. They are a party that primarily uh, depends on white, rural, less educated American voters as the heart of their coalition. And this only works. The only reason it works is because the Electoral College in the United States uh, gives disproportionate influence to these states. Uh, so, so far, uh, not only did he win, but there's a path for him to win uh, next week uh, in November because of that. The question is, in the long term, is this destructive? Is it destructive, A, because this coalition is never going to broaden and eventually it's, it's going to just be overwhelmed by the changes taking place in America? And we see some of that in states like Texas and Georgia, which are still the heart of this Republican coalition. But they're increasingly diverse and pluralistic and educated and don't match what, what he needs. Is, is he, as a president, going to drag down the Republican Party? Are, are the Republicans looking at defeats not just next week, but for several years to come because uh, of his failure? Is he a new Herbert Hoover uh, because of what's happened with the pandemic here in the country? But we don't know. Uh, we don't know that yet, but that's the argument that he will have terrible effects for the party in the long term. Well, um, Thank you for that whistle-stop tour of post-war American political history and uh, through your work on this period. Scholars speak of the long 19th century, and as I've been looking through your work uh, in preparation for today's talk, um, I think you could make an argument for a long 20th century with 20 or 30 years on either side, like bookends from Reconstruction to the present. Um, so um, to go back to where we began, are the two parties too similar today. As people on the left say, they, they both have the same economic agenda, it's all the same thing. Or are they too distinct along social issues such as abortion and along geographical lines at the national level with the diversity within the party disappearing? You know, liberal Vermont Republicans and conservative Mississippi Democrats are becoming fewer and everyone is throwing the national party line. I think they're, they're uh, so both are true in and that's that's one of the subtleties of American politics that's important in that 
it is true that on certain issues, even with all our divisions and fault lines, the, the parties are, they're not in agreement, but they're really not doing much about certain issues. And clearly uh, you could argue that on economic inequality, that there's a lot of uh, many people in both parties who just are not making that a priority in a serious way. And, and so there's a frustration among progressives, for example, that sure, uh, Joe Biden is better than Donald Trump in their minds, but this isn't a solution because they'll say Biden uh, works in a world of lobbyists and corporate power uh, that very much doesn't care about the issues of the day. So, so there are areas like that that neither party addresses sufficiently, but I think the differences are more striking to me. I think, uh, I don't think the parties are the same. I, I think the Republicans uh, as a whole have moved, and, and a lot of social science confirms this, they've moved further to the right as a whole than Democrats have uh, to the left as a whole. And they've embraced a much more extreme form of partisanship than Democrats have. And you can see this in the candidates running right now. I mean, Democrats ended up going with Joe Biden, even with all these progressives running and all this very high level of emotion about the presidency. They went with the most moderate person in the bunch, someone who believes in the kind of traditional uh, forms of, of politics and governance. And so I think uh, the Republicans are definitely a more extreme party and they're continuing to move in that direction. I see no signs that they're going to reverse this, even if President Trump loses. I think for at least the next two, four years, they're going to double down on this. Democrats have a different, so, so for the Republicans, the problem is uh, not for the nation, but for the GOP, is that viable? Can you survive with this model? Uh, and then what does that do for the country if one party is so uh, intractable and so invested in a form of politics which doesn't really work well with governing as we're seeing in the pandemic? Democrats are actually much more diverse and split up. And so their challenge is how do you bridge different coalitions? Um, the, uh, they now have the Democrats a much more formidable progressive element in the party. You saw that with the support for Bernie Sanders uh, in the Democratic primary. You see it with some very vocal and talented uh, legislators like AOC um, who has become a presence in the Democratic caucus. But Democrats also still have many, many uh, moderates um, in their party. Uh, and in fact, most of the legislators who won in 2018 in the midterms are pretty to the center uh, of the Democratic party on a lot of key issues. So I think their challenge is, is going to be uh, balancing um, those different elements if they're successful. But for the country, it's a big problem because there's definitely nowhere in the middle of the party and there are no bridge builders. And I don't think there's a lot of, I think there is some interest among some Democrats to work with Republicans. I just think that's the nature of the Democratic party, but that doesn't exist right now with the GOP. So in terms of governing, either you're gonna have Democrats finding a way to keep everyone on the same page and then pushing legislation through that doesn't have any Republican support, just pure partisan muscle, uh, or you're gonna have nothing or meager kind of bills that don't address uh, issues like climate change that we are dealing with. And, and I don't know, first, I don't know who's gonna win, but if Democrats win, I think that's really gonna be one of the big questions. How do you deal with all of that? So the questions are, are pouring in. Um, I've, I've, um, I've grouped together three questions uh, that are related to the mechanics of the election. And I think tie in with some of your work on the Princeton Election Consortium with Professor Sam Wang this year. Uh, they are uh, redistricting the electoral college system and the challenges to every vote getting counted. So just briefly, I'll say that um, one problem in a democracy, of course, is where the majority vote wins, how do you get minority candidates elected? So in India, uh, famously, Gandhi and Dr. Ambedkar, the architect of our constitution, butted heads on how to so address the problem. In America, this was solved by creating voting districts around minority populations, but that system is being dismantled. Um, on the electoral college, which you've spoken about a bit, 
Al Gore in 2000 and Hillary Clinton in 2016 won the popular vote, which is the majority of votes. So to most people outside the United States, it's a mystery um, why they didn't win. So is it time to change it, your view on that? And then on um, uh, every vote getting counted in this election, there have already been several cases. Uh, what are some of the challenges? So um, all three are very important. And it's funny, you know, in, in American, it, well, in all politics, we, we tend often to focus on personality these days, uh, increasingly, certainly here in the United States. And these kinds of structural questions, which get so much to the heart of a lot of issues that we're dealing with, are quite important. And uh, in terms of redistricting, that's a really um, top issue. We, we, we've had gerrymandering here in the United States, which gerrymandering basically means the creation of congressional districts here is left to the states. And so state legislatures are um, increased, they, they are the ones who have the power to shape uh, who votes in, in what uh, parts. And what we've had happen, especially since the 1970s, is A, this process has become perfected in ways no one could imagine because of computer technology. The same technology that allows a company like Amazon to micro-target consumers allows state legislatures to micro-target voters and create perfect districts where one party is going to win all the time. And increasingly in one party states, since 2010 especially, you've seen just huge uh, blocks of um, the congressional electorate perfectly gerrymandered so that only one party can win and the only opposition voice that's ever heard in that district is a primary challenge that goes more to the extreme uh, rather than to the center. So the structure of redistricting pushes against competition in congressional politics and really allows one party to dominate an area. And so that makes the problem the questioner asked really worse than usual. We already have a winner take all system. We already have a system where the losers don't get input as you would in a parliamentary system. But now it's so much worse because the tools of redistricting are perfect. There is uh, efforts, there are efforts in different states um, to change the way redistricting works to rely on nonpartisan commissions or bipartisan commissions to craft districts so that it would create a more fair playing field and try to create more competition because uh, that's a way out of polarization. If politicians believe they need to appeal to voters from the other party, they're more likely to do things that result in compromise. If they're not, there's no reason for them to do that. So uh, we'll see, there, there is progress on it. Part of it though depends on the Supreme Court because every time some challenge to districting happens, it ends up in the Supreme Court. And now we have a Supreme Court that will not be hospitable to these kinds of questions. So I don't know if in the end, the new court will check some of the progress that's been made, but, but let's see. Because there, there's a lot of people, even in both parties really, who hate the way our districts work because it just stifles democracy. Um, second, in terms of the electoral college, this is a problem that is not new. It's been discussed for a while, but the fact is we've now had two presidents since 2000 that didn't have the popular vote, but won uh, the electoral college vote. And that creates questions of legitimacy. In the modern era that we live in today, uh, it's hard for many Americans to understand why should a candidate who wins an overwhelming number of voters in this country not be the president? Doesn't make sense. You're basically, uh, it, it's not a, it's winner take all, but the minority is the winner take all. So huge portions of the population simply don't get attention. Uh, and there is support uh, certainly for reforming it. The last time we really tried to reform the electoral college uh, was in the seventies, in the 1970s, but in, in the end it fizzled. Uh, there was some effort after the 2000 election to do it, but it fizzled. Uh, and the problem is often this is just not an issue people care about enough, meaning a lot of people don't like the electoral college, but they're going to vote about the economy, they're going to vote about war and peace, they're going to vote about partisan loyalty. The electoral college is not the kind of issue that gets a lot of excitement. So 
I'm still dubious anything is going to happen. Uh, the biggest promise for reform is a new a group. It's not new. It's been around now, I think, since 2015 or 16, that's trying to convince state uh, governments to sign a compact that they will give their vote to whoever wins the popular vote in the state. Uh, but so far, I think only blue or primarily blue states, democratic states, have signed on to it. So it's a problem. It's a problem. Uh, and I don't think you're going to get a lot of Republican support for eliminating it because it is, as we said, uh, the heart of, of the Republican coalition. You have to remind me the third question. Uh, do you think every vote will get counted in this election? Oh, yeah. So that, that's something I've written a lot about. And it's really a, it's a disturbing element of American politics. I'm not convinced every vote will count. Um, you know, we've definitely seen uh, since uh, the 2010s, this uh, strong drive in Republican states to primarily Republican states to curtail voting with more voting restrictions um, based on allegations of voter fraud that have never uh, been proven by any study. But we have over 25 states that have put on the books voting laws from uh, making it difficult to vote early uh, to uh, requiring photo ID that's often hard to get in certain parts of the country if you don't drive, if you don't have a car, uh, that make it difficult for people to vote. So even before the pandemic, I and others were definitely worried that these laws um, are going to be a big problem. There's a lot of Americans who might end up going to vote and their votes will be discounted because of these restrictions. And, and it's quite important in states like Wisconsin uh, where uh, the state's going to play a big part in this election, and those voting restrictions are pretty pretty tough. Um, felons, for example, are not allowed to vote uh, in many states. That's another area of, of disenfranchisement that's happened here in, in the country. The Supreme Court in 2013 legitimated all of this when they uh, knocked down a key part of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, that Lyndon Johnson passed and allowed the states to do this. So added to voting restrictions, you now have the pandemic. And the pandemic, uh, from the moment it happened, uh, I think every person who follows politics, like this is gonna be a big problem. Uh, most important, uh, a lot of Americans might not feel safe voting in parts of the country, standing in long lines, standing close to each other, going into poorly ventilated schools and touching the same machine. Uh, it's, it's clear a lot of our polling uh, places are usually staffed by elderly Americans who are most vulnerable to COVID. So we don't know if they will be adequately staffed. We're seeing already from early voting here in the United States that many states, including democratic states like New York have not adequately opened enough polling stations and already the lines are several hours long for early voting here, which doesn't pretend well. And, and that could dissuade people from voting. Uh, so it's a way votes don't end up counting. And, and finally, um, one of the solutions to all of this, uh, which had been pushed since March, was we're going to need absentee voting uh, to be a central mechanism. And here in the states, we're now seeing historic numbers of people vote voting by mail. They've already voted. Our election's already well underway. And in states like Texas, there are more people voting by mail than has ever happened uh, in the history. But one concern that looms large is, are these all counted? I mean, uh, processing mail-in votes is not easy. It requires a lot of human power. And the states were not given enough money by the federal government to get ready for this. And so, um, if this is close, and it might not be, but if it's close, there's going to be challenges to absentee ballots. You'll have lawyers from the party saying this one shouldn't count because the bubble isn't filled in perfectly. And I worry uh, if that's the, if it's a close election, you're going to see votes discounted. And that's a terrible thing. Uh, there's no reason for that to happen. That should go well beyond partisanship in this country. Every vote needs to count. So um, there's a group of questions around classical conservative principles. Have free trade and balanced budgets been given the heave-ho? Um, what about internationalism, which used to be, um, you know, a 
Eisenhower was the World War II general that you referred to, was Republican and opposed isolationism. Um, uh, you know, wh where was, will all this go? The, you know, in, in terms of the future of the Republican Party. Um, there have also been some questions on uh, Amy Barrett, who's, who's been confirmed today with lifetime tenure, one of the long-term consequences of the Trump presidency. Will this jeopardize the separation of powers with the balance of the court shifting? So uh, classical conservative principles, separation of powers. I think on, on the classical conservative principles, I mean, those principles haven't really uh, been totally in effect. And, and if anything, uh, President Trump might have just uh, kind of officially brought some of them to an end. I mean, balanced budgets are something Republicans have talked about forever, but they just haven't really uh, implemented that as a principle. Eisenhower did for sure. This was one of his major issues in the 1950s. But Reagan accepted huge deficits. Um, George W. Bush accepted huge deficits. And Donald Trump really doesn't care about deficits at all. Uh, Republicans on, in, in Congress have gone along with all three of those presidents. The only outlier was George H.W. Bush, who actually pushes through a deficit reduction package in 1990, reversing a promise he made never to raise taxes. But the outcome was Republicans hated him. They, they wouldn't even support him, conservatives, in 1992. So I think that principle really hasn't been as important. I think it's just rhetoric. And um, I just don't think it's a principle. Liberal internationalism has been under strain within the GOP. This isn't all entirely Trump. Um, kind of the notion that the United States needed to live and work within a coalition of allies and work through international institutions has been challenged by Republicans. Uh, the United Nations has been a focus of attack for the GOP for a long time. Reagan was already kind of raising this question of why do we pay so much uh, even though we're often isolated, uh, according to Reagan, in decision making. There's been a reluctance to really follow uh, international uh, consensus among allies on foreign policy. Uh, Bush showed this with Iraq. He, I mean, he, he just he used whatever coalition he could put together to legitimate what he was going to do. Um, but I do think I think Trump has gone further in really disparaging their value altogether. All those presidents uh, who had strains with uh, the idea of internationalism still accepted this was the world in which the U.S. had to operate. We didn't operate alone. It was impossible. It was destructive. I think what um, uh, Trump has done is he's taken the elements that were critical and brought them to the forefront. And I don't know. I don't know if you're really going to have um, Republican presidents and leaders championing internationalism for some time to come. I, I think it's going to be now a partisan issue. Democrats still remain pretty committed to those principles, in part because of Trump. I think they're going to double down now to show uh, what they're about. So I think they're under threat. Separation of powers is a big problem. I don't think it's just the Supreme Court. I think it's this intense partisanship we're talking about. I mean, one of the things you saw with President Trump was this unbelievable loyalty from congressional Republicans. And congressional Republicans have basically been willing to let him do almost anything he wants. And uh, the impeachment showed that extends to using foreign aid as uh, leverage for campaign assistance. And the Republicans on no issue uh, other than one or two have come out against them. And it's raised this problem when you have uh, this kind of partisanship and you have uh, united control of government. Uh, certainly we had that with the Senate and the White House. It creates a big problem. It undermines the balance of power because Republicans of our era, and I really believe this is true, don't see their job as balancing partisanship, governance, and our system of institutions. It's partisanship above all all. And that's a threat. That's a real threat to the separation of power. And we'll see how the court affects it. Um, but we have now a very political court. And so it certainly will um, weaken the idea that the courts are a separate institution. I think more Americans now just see this as yet another arm of our politics. That's right. So with the changing demographics, can the GOP reinvent itself? How will 
it address uh, immigration in the future? There's been a host of questions about the future of the Republican Party. Uh, today's uh, New York Times had an op-ed saying, rest in peace, GOP. Uh, what do you think? Um, uh, the future of the party to, in 10 years from yeah. now. I mean, I've learned enough, I guess, studying American history, never to predict the party is done. And uh, again, after 2008, I was on so many panels about this and is the Republican Party over? Is conservatism dead? And that didn't happen at all. Um, so uh, yes, a party is capable of remaking itself. It's very hard right now, I think. Uh, it will take some bold leadership, not just at the highest level, but at the local level, kind of younger Republicans uh, who don't think this is viable. It's going to take uh, Republicans who believe that they have to appeal to more voters or they won't survive, but that can happen. Uh, I think it's, it's important to remember constituencies change. So you, you even see a little of this. Lat Latino Americans, for example, uh, while generally they're still supporting Democrats, there are some pockets of Republican support in places like Miami and Florida, um, but people change their identity over time. So like Irish Catholic voters in the United States, if you asked me this in the 1960s, would they ever vote for Republicans? People would say, no, they're, they're Democrats. They've been Democrats, it's generational, but a lot of them shifted uh, to the Republican party. So identity can change. And so we have to remember uh, that as well. And, and obviously national crises, we don't know what the next crisis is, but it might be a crisis that ends up lending support to Republicans. It might be if you have a Biden White House and a Biden Congress and something terrible happens in the US and he doesn't handle it well, it could broaden support. So, so I think it's really too early to just say that this party is over. It's fair to say it's a party that in the short term is really struggling and barely hanging on to power at this point. So we're we heading towards an era of mediocrity, uh, you know, with this with this unprecedented level of strife. It could be. I mean, I, I do. I feel that way about how the pandemic has been handled. There's been uh, so many very uh, easy answers within the interim of not having a vaccine and treatments that we just haven't done. Uh, and you, if you follow American politics, mediocre is, is probably the nicest way to describe what has been happening. There's this low hanging fruit, which from a purely political perspective, you'd say I'd assume the parties or certainly the president of the United States would wanna do this because it'll only make him look better. Uh, like, you know, why not encourage mask use so that states recover and the economy does better? Like that's obvious, but it doesn't happen. And then on bigger issues like climate change and gun control, um, where it's not really a question that we have major problems, it's the mediocrity that is always triumphant right now. Even when there's outpourings of support for change or in criminal justice, the political system veers right back to doing nothing. And it's a problem. And the pandemic, unlike some other problems like climate change is very immediate in the consequences. We see just how much we suffer as a nation when our government leaders can't address these kinds of issues. We began with the legacy of slavery, which is alive and well as seen in the uh, police violence that has kindled the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, what do you think its impact will be on this election and on, on the party? Dr. King, remember, said, let us realize the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Uh, these have been dark times. Do you see reasons for optimism on racial justice? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I mean, King's prediction, which is beautiful and, and poignant, also is problematic in that some of the questions he was wrestling with and other civil rights leaders were wrestling with, like police brutality, are still very much present. So I do think there's many... Uh, Americans and supporters of civil rights who, who want King to have been correct, but become frustrated and that we're still dealing with the same issues right now. The only difference is they're being captured on phones. And so they're more visible, but there is reason to be optimistic. I mean, um, the outpouring of support um, for criminal justice reform this summer 
at a moment when many Americans were still terrified to leave their homes um, and uh, scared about uh, health. The fact people did it, they did it generally in very safe ways. Now we're seeing that's pretty true. And they were very fervent and emotional about this basic human right uh, to be safe from police authorities as much as from criminals uh, when you go out of your house. I do think has a lot of support among younger people in this country. It is an issue the candidates talk about. I mean, Joe Biden, who was in a very different place in the 1990s on these questions, in the debates and speeches, talks about Black Lives Matter and criminal justice reform often. Uh, Kamala Harris does as well. I don't think Democrats, you're not going to find many Democrats who are against the basic thrust of the movement. Sure, there's differences over how do you reform policing and is something like defunding the police a good idea? And, and there's debates, but you don't have any Democrats who are against the movement. Uh, and, and I think there's even some support in the Republican Party too. Um, you know, one of the bills that uh, Trump will often talk about is his criminal justice reform bill in 2017, which was definitely not sufficient to what had to happen. And, and he himself has railed against Black Lives Matter. But there are Republicans who understand this is a really relevant, important issue and, and morally uh, relevant issue. And, and you hear some, some more talk about that in the GOP. So between the generational change the fact this is now an issue that we discuss rather than ignore, the way in which technology won't allow this to go away, it's not going to allow violations of human rights to not be discovered. There's some hope, but, but again, as I often tell young people, this was being discussed in the late 60s and the forces against change were very powerful and they remain so today. So it's gonna be a fight, it's gonna be a struggle, but there is a movement now that's taking it on. So, so I find that a really good development in this nation. Well, abolitionists had to push Lincoln until he got there. And, um, you know, Noam Chomsky and others on the left have said, vote Democrat, but push the party to a more progressive agenda. Um, you know, you talked about the role of Bernie Sanders in this election. So I, I think the key uh, is to be politically engaged. Before, we, one final thing before we let you go, I know you're not a soothsayer, but it's hard to resist asking you for an educated guess, the outcome of the yeah. election next week. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm, I'm like everyone else. Um, I, I mean, well, I'm like everyone else in that I understand after 2016, any prediction uh, has to be said uh, with a lot of hesitation because you can see how uh, dramatic the outcome can go in a different way than you expect. But I'm also hesitant often because I think this is fundamentally still a close election. I think uh, because it is, you can't really predict. I think this uh, is going to come down to the ground game that happens between now and next week. I think it's going to be about which party turns out the vote, which party has more people canvassing uh, Americans and, and trying to persuade them which party in the end uh, gets those slivers. I think it's very clear that Joe Biden is in a very good position. He is doing well in the polls. He's doing well in the polls consistently. There's fewer Americans who are undecided and on the fence. We're seeing overwhelming uh, levels of early voting, which we think at least, we think is favoring the Democrats. And there's evidence, evidence that in states like Texas, uh, Democrats have a chance to win, uh, both for the presidency and even at the state level. It's not like a pipe dream that that's going to happen. And, and so I think all of that is real. On the other hand, I think it's true that the Electoral College gives um, President Trump a way to win again. Uh, even without the popular vote. And it's very clear that the enthusiasm of Republicans is incredibly high for their candidate. And we're seeing that in levels of registration, which are higher in some key states than they are for Democrats, which is a red flag. So if I was betting, I'd bet on Joe Biden winning, uh, not by a landslide, but by a decent number. But, but it's not a kind of like 1964 where I don't even think in retrospect we'll be able to look back and say it was obvious. Um, there's a big opportunity for Democrats to take back the White House, but it's gonna matter 
what happens in the next few days on the ground, not on television. So uh, a very big thank you, Professor Zelizer, for speaking to us today from New York. I know you have a very busy schedule and uh, you know, in this season especially, so thank you. Uh, thanks also to our audience for tuning in. Please join us for our next program on BIC Streams. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.